next session. Session two. Change in its implications. I've got very, very strong views. They're all arrived at on the basis of research. Not they don't come out of the top of my head. And uh, I challenge you, as I know one of our one of the people here is going to challenge me on where you think I've gone wrong because I'm prepared to accept that I may have gone wrong because I want to move up the learning curve uh, if, higher than I believe I am already uh, have already reached. Uh, so do feel free to challenge me on anything I say because what I have to say is <coughs> going to be fairly forthright and um, uh, to the point and. Uh, it intended to make you think hard and, to a degree, to upset you. Let's start off by making the following point. All of you are here because you care about climate change, yet I would suggest that very few of you indeed have even worked out your own carbon footprint. Is that a reflection of how much you care about the future of the planet and the damage being done by our, by our lifestyles? Or does it represent the fact that you aren't truly aware of the dire state of the planet and the trajectory we are heading for in terms of making it uh, worse and worse in the future. Um, to a degree, we all, and I include myself here, are complicit in this damaging process because if we engage in any activities which are carbon-based, and most of our activities are carbon-based, then you are complicit, you are contributing towards this uh, um, what I call a legacy uh, for uh, future generations and uh, the younger ones in this uh, audience here will be the, the, the ones who will suffer far more than the older ones in this audience. But those who will suffer even more are people in the third world and the next generation, they will get even worse in following generations. And why do I say that? For the following reason, I've set out ten what I call legacies that we'll be bequeathing to future generations. All relates, don't worry, to when we'll be talking about the market economy. But the um, ten legacies starting off with, we know, we know for sure that the planet will be in a worse state now <coughs> in 20 years' time than it is now, uh, that in 40 years' time it'll be even worse, and yet we go on and we have our government and we don't scream at it uh, intent on catering for rising demand, for instance, for travel by air, by train, by, uh, uh, as if train is carbon neutral, which is far from particularly high-speed rail, uh, uh, catering for more road travel by building roads and so on, and intent, as we all know, on somehow or other returning to a state of economic growth that, that we had in the early part of this decade, uh, and because will come in its way, uh, job generation, as if that is sufficient justification for the maintenance of a process which is so, so damaging and so closely linked to climate change and the causes of climate change if we return to the level of productivity and the, lay, uh, the, the rate uh, which government and the opposition that are, are, are parties are intent upon, uh, then we will make things even worse. But as uh, Phil Thornhill pointed out in his opening remarks this morning, um, the uh, level of CO2 emissions, if I got it down wrong, are 70% higher than they were now, higher than they were in 1992, at a time during the last two decades when we have known about the linkage between climate change and the burning of, of fossil fuels in particular. So at a time during these two decades when we know that not that we've got to reduce our carbon emissions as much as possible, but they have got to get be got down to zero carbon. And when I say zero carbon, I mean zero carbon. I don't mean to say to refer to this parlous target that uh, everybody seems to be carelessly accepting, namely an 80% reduction by 2050. Well, we know that that means, or that would mean, if that were the target that we, that we were able to realise, that the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will be far higher than they are now when it is already acknowledged that they are in all likelihood already out of control. And if you don't believe me, just think to yourselves, perhaps, not at this point in time, but when you go to bed tonight, as how many years do you think it will be before we can return the level of Arctic ice 
to the level it was in 1992 when it is reduced by whatever it is 40 percent or so just in the last few years do you see do you see that as, as a, a reversible process of course it isn't we're already in a state where things are getting worse and worse so that is what one of the uh, legacies we are hugely immorally bequeathing to future generations on top of that Far fewer of the finite uh, reserves of minerals, and particularly of fossil fuels, uh, uh, because, and why, why is this so? Because extraordinarily, really extraordinarily, we have excluded the claims of future generations on these finite resources. I find it quite inconceivable that we've got to this state, here we are in, whatever it is, uh, June 2012, and still that hasn't featured as an item in government calculation. When you hear the oil companies, for instance, stating uh, that we've only got 30 or 40 years left, we have only got 30, 40 years of oil left, what do they mean by we? They mean us, us, this generation, as if the future generations have got no claim. The planet has got a finite capacity to absorb further burning of fossil fuels, finite capacity, how is it to be shared out? You can't just say, well, let's share it out by dividing it by the world's population, which would be one step towards it, but then I come along and I talk about the claims of future generations on this finite capacity to prevent us going even further down a road uh, uh, to, to make the whole process absolutely irreversible rather than partly or largely irreversible, absolutely uh, ir irreversible. How do we do that? A third one is we know that we're going to have extensive water and food shortages. The climate change is already and is, it's going to be an accelerating process causing um, a massive migration, particularly from third world and countries like Bangladesh. And where are those uh, migrants going to go? Where are they going to go? Well, naturally, they will wish uh, to head to parts of the or regions of the world which have not been uh, so heavily damaged by climate change. And where is that the sort of place that they will head for? Well, I were a Bangladeshi in uh, 10 years' time or 20 years' time, I would head for Northern Europe because that will be relatively spared from the worst depredations of climate change. And what does that mean? That means that they're going to be coming to the shores of the UK and Norway and Sweden and Denmark uh, and perhaps the Netherlands and so on. And what are we going to say? Oh, come in, it was all our fault. Yeah, we should, we should have gone on burning fossil fuels. You know how much we... we, we uh, how, the importance we attach to uh, political political refugees and, and people who have suffered by virtue of, of uh, dictatorships and so on. In this instance, of course, it's all our fault, but do come in, do come in, we'll, we've got lots of room for you. And if you think, as I've heard uh, politicians say, if you think, well, perhaps more logically they will go to adjacent countries. Let me tell you that the Indian government has built a 2,000 kilometer fence between Bangladesh and India in anticipation of that particular problem. So I wouldn't like to be my grandchildren. Then there is almost certainly going to be a catastrophic loss of life in wars of survival because the habitability of the land is in decline because uh, uh, resources are declining. Um, there will be a serious risk of, uh, as we heard from the last session, mm. radioactive waste leakages, um, uh, risks of uh, war from nuclear proliferation, particularly if, as many argue, including those in this blessed coalition government of ours, uh, which says that the future depends upon us developing nuclear power. If we develop nuclear power, then we have got no right to say that any country uh, should not mm develop <clears throat> nuclear power, which means that the risk attendant on, I mean, uh, Japan, a very advanced nation, and yet what happened there, we heard about that in the last session, uh, those are the risks which will have been accelerated by decisions taken uh, by the governments in these in next few years without regard to the, or without considering even, I don't think, uh, the you know, responsibilities imposed upon future generations, for, for, for instance, for 10,000 generations, for looking after the uh, nuclear waste products of that process, and what for it to be uh, um, made a, a global solution to our problem uh, at, at phenomenal cost, again, as we heard in the uh, last session. There will be huge accumulated debts that we are imposing on future generations as governments continue to, in effect, buy the 
uh, enable the present to be carried on in its uh, undesirable way uh, to go on into the future by lowering the uh, well by, by through the debt process. But perhaps the most remarkable legacy we're leaving that leaving for the future is I'm a child of the wartime and remember very well a bombing in London and I can tell you that that was a pretty horrific period but we knew naturally from history that the world that the war would end so whilst we didn't know how long it would run we knew that it would end in the case of this situation we're talking about of climate change, we are heading down the road, as I say, towards a devastation of the habitability of the planet, and our children and our grandchildren are having to live in a world in which every day they read about, uh, and increasingly reading about some more horrific incident somewhere around the world with no prospect of it getting better, no prospect, but only a prospect of it getting a lot worse. Well, you know, from that perspective, if you start deciding what policies should be adopted in relation to the market, uh, you would be, I don't think, uh, 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 very happy with the proposition the government puts out, which is its primary function is to return to economic growth and to return to a state of much higher levels of employment, uh, the, those being, in its, from its perspective, far more important. Uh, 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 goals uh, to achieve than protection the, 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 uh, a reduction in the otherwise likely uh, legacies uh, which I have just outlined. Government sees this role and, and I get the feeling that many of the speakers that I've heard during the course of the day that government sees this role as meeting demand where it's fossil fuel ba or where it's energy based, meeting that demand is uh, in as least da in a, 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 as little damaging a way as possible. That is where it is wrong. It is wrong. The determination of what the government should be doing should not be based on the public demand because the public wants to have its cake and eat it. Obviously, it's interesting <coughs> in all of us we would like to have our cake and eat it. Uh, what the government should be doing is to have the uh, demand uh, determined according to the means of the planet, the means of the planet uh, uh, to cope with what we do uh, and with the burgeoning population. And that puts an altogether different cast on what we should be doing. It should be determined by the finite nature of the, of, of, of the, or the finite capacity of the planet's atmosphere to absorb further burning of fossil fuels. But as I said in my opening remark, if you imagine uh, that that can be determined simply by uh, setting down that capacity and climate scientists enable us to do that and divide it by the world population, you're not there because you're excluding the claims of future generations. And as soon as you accept that as a reasonable proposition, then you've got to say to yourself, hey, just one second, how many future generations, five, seven, like the Red Indians did, uh, or, or an infinite number, it almost doesn't matter because you are then dividing that finite capacity of the capacity of the, uh, of, of the atmosphere to absorb further burning fossil fuels by an infinite number. And therefore, we've got to head for a zero carbon, uh, uh, a z zero carbon uh, world as quickly as possible, ideally yesterday. Uh, and if not yesterday, then remarkably, we've just got to drop doing anything which is using fossil fuels because uh, the, the burning of those fossil fuels uh, produce emissions which accumulate in the atmosphere for 100 or more years and therefore add to their concentrations. Climate scientists tell us that those concentrations are, um, uh, are presently about 40% higher than they were at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution when we found coal, gas and oil and realised that this was a way of in maintaining or improving our material standard of living. Almost everything that we've done in, 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 since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution has only been possible by virtue of us uh, burning fossil fuels without any regard whatsoever, almost no regard whatsoever, to the implications that this has from an ecological perspective. And it's outrageous and it's time that we stop dithering around saying how can we meet the demand by renewables, how can we meet the demand by nuclear, how can we use fossil fuels more efficiently than we did in the past. 
and um, uh, it, it is for that reason that I would challenge government to uh, reconsider its, mm. its position uh, in, in a far, far, far more fundamental way and not to go down that road of, in effect, uh, uh, seeking to curry favour with the public by not spelling out the dire situation we were in. Uh, you may have heard in the uh, uh, 12 o'clock plenary session um, uh, the statement made that Martin Luther King wouldn't have gone, got very far uh, if he had said, I have a nightmare rather than I have a dream. I found that, I mean, I know a number of people in the audience laughed at that point, but I found that quite an outrageous position to take. And had I caught the chairman's eye, which I didn't try to because I knew I'd have the opportunity of spelling it out here, is what I wanted to um, uh, put to the former director of Greenpeace was to say to him, and is it a dream of yours that the Arctic ice uh, will reform itself as it was in the past, or perhaps uh, you want to face up to the nightmare that it can't conceivably do so now within any, you know, within a few hundred years, it's too late and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So for government to say that the 80% reduction in 2050 is a realistic target which commands wide support belies the fact that, for instance, they're talking just about UK or some uh, European uh, EC uh, uh, governments at the same time, whereas this is a global problem. Uh, the world, the, the, the UK contributes only 1% of the world's population and 2% of the world's emissions, roughly. The Americans have about 20 tonnes of uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, per year, per capita. Uh, in this country, about 12 tonnes. In um, China, about coming up to five tonnes, so it's not the third world. They've also got to decline to zero. Um, in India, about one tonne, um, and uh, the average for the world being at four tonnes, just over four tonnes. So here we are in a situation where we're just sort of, I, I don't know, putting on blinkers and hoping it'll go away if we have a good night's sleep. Let's take some sleeping tablets and think that tomorrow morning we'll find out that technology is ridden to the rescue. And that is a theme that one hears so widely, particularly by people uh, in government who really don't know the answer, but say, and I'm quoting here now, stop worrying about these issues. Technology will ride to the rescue. It always has done. Look at the past in history. Technology will find ways and means of accommodating the fact that the concentrations of CO2 are rising at the time when they should be reducing. Technology can do wonders and sit back and go back to sleep, so to speak. It's just total wishful thinking, and it's got to stop, not uh, uh, sort of be cited less and less. And to talk about energy efficiency as a primary way of reducing emissions again, belies the fact that, for instance, in the car industry, uh, the efficiency with which one can travel uh, 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 on a mm. litre of petrol, uh, has, has, uh, uh, the, the distance one can travel has increased mm. quite sharply in the last few years through efficiency gains, but that hasn't led to a reduction in the amount of uh, fuel going into cars, simply because you've lowered the cost of travel and therefore encouraged more and more people to travel. So it's not necessarily, uh, in, in some respects, it could be seen to be uh, counterproductive in terms of achieving uh, the objectives that we must do. So I would put this all down to uh, uh, government uh, subscribing to uh, a range of fallacious assumptions. I'll just cite a few of them, and particularly the ones relating to the market. Uh, and, and that is uh, that it is seen to be that uh, it's seen that the public have got in some inalien inalienable right to do what they want unless there's a law against it. In other words, if you want to fly to Australia, you can fly to Australia, even though you know, and if you don't know, that's a failure of government in its educational programme, even though you know it is contributing to this deterioration in the condition of the planet. That is just wrong. It's immoral. You know, it should just should not be allowed and if that interferes with the democratic process of what 
what this country subscribes to, um, uh, in other words, preventing people doing from what they want to do, so be it. If it's in, against the public interest, and particularly against the long-term public interest, then I fear, and this is something I cited 20 years ago, that we're on a collision course with maintaining democratic principles and ensuring that we preserve the future of the planet for, for our children and grandchildren and beyond. If that has got to be, if that is going to be our choice and we're heading that way, then sadly, and it's the only instance where I would have to uh, um, abandon the pursuit of democracy. We cannot allow this to go on happening. And yet, um, I, mean, I won't embarrass you by asking uh, those of you who do have, uh, uh, have worked out their carbon footprint or those of you who still fly, uh, but I can reasonably assure you that if I were to ask you to do so, it would be the great majority that do. So what does that indicate to us? It indicates to us the fact that the change that is needed will not come about on a voluntary basis. It will come about when there is a mandatory requirement to live within the planet's limits. How is that to be done? Obviously through the medium of contraction and convergence, the uh, framework uh, put forward <coughs> first 17 years ago by the Global Commons Institute, a, a logical system of saying contraction, everybody agrees we've got to contract emissions, and then convergence towards equal per capita shares with the national mass manifestation of this in the form of personal carbon allowances. Nobody could realistically say, no, 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 we shouldn't have equal equal shares of uh, this finite capacity. Um, uh, what we need to do is to carry on with unequal shares. If we got to it first, uh, then we should have a right to have more, uh, a big share. In the past, poorer people were able to be told uh, that they shouldn't complain about their slice of the cake uh, because... Uh, economic growth would deliver a larger cake. Once we recognise that that cake has got a finite size, we have seriously got to address the issue of how to share it out. And I would argue, and I hope most of you would argue, too, uh, that the only way of sharing it out is on the equal per capita basis. Now, when that is imposed on, as, as government is will be required to do so. It hasn't done so yet, but it will have to do it because it will otherwise just get worse and worse, like uh, uh, what Phil Thornhill told us, the 72% or 70% increase in carbon emissions since 1992. It'll get worse and worse, and the uh, depredations that, that we are already witnessing will get worse and accelerate, mm -hmm. somewhat like the 10... 10 uh, Oh, ten plagues in, 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 in Exodus. Things will get worse and worse until reason prevails. And uh, uh, I, I would then hone in, because I imagine my time's running over. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, still got five minutes. Right, right. Uh, uh, what, what, what does, what does that, that mean? It means that with carbon <laughs> rationing, people with, uh, are rationed. Those have got to decline year on year very sharply. Tradable because it will then have a social justice element built into it, because uh, people who don't use their ration will be able to sell on the market, so I acknowledge a role for the market, uh, will be able to sell their surplus to uh, people who are still uh, uh, needing or feeling they have to or, or can afford to exceed uh, their ration by paying for it. But they don't get away with it because they can afford to do so, because the ration reduces and the availability year on year and therefore the availability of surplus decline sharply which means that the cost of doing so uh, rises even more sharply with the result that even wealthy people will not be able uh, to go on leading lifestyles anywhere near what they are today and it will certainly exclude things like living in, in uh, properly insulated homes, it will certainly exclude any flying whatsoever, it will certainly include, e exclude uh, high speed rail and, and this sort of thing, our lives will be far far more oriented around uh, uh, lo lo local lifestyles um, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the question as to whether that is acceptable or not is irrelevant uh, because we do not have a right to go on destroying the habitability of the planet. I come back to that same theme. We do not have a right to do so. So why are we allowing it? Why are we allowing our government to do so? On it? And so they come back to the point, don't rely on uh, 
persuasion or education or subsidy or something like that to persuade everybody to, in effect, behave themselves in an ecological way because we know it won't happen. It just won't happen. So it's got to be done mandatorily. And back to food rationing in 1939, uh, that was introduced by a Conservative government without any demonstrations in Trafalgar Square. It was accepted as a fair way of dealing with a commodity, a basic commodity in short supply. It was shared out. And that, is, that was the way in which the the threat of, and, and, and the need to go to war with fascism was dealt with, we have got a far, far greater war ahead of us, which is the survival of life on Earth, not just the, uh, uh, just the people, who are, uh, uh, the small proportion of the population who, who are suffering. Now, as far as the market is concerned, it fails because the government, like uh, the whole sort of capitalist system, uh, depends upon... Uh, the, attaching a monetary value to everything in order for the market to operate. And that's where it fails. How can you attach a monetary value to something which is going to have damaging effects for 100 years' time? The Bangladeshis, for instance, having to migrate from their own homeland, let alone attaching a value to that itself, having to leave your homeland. But the consequences of resettlement of tens, if not hundreds of millions of people. How can you put a money value on the release of a tonne of carbon emissions to uh, accommodate that? consideration. It obviously doesn't work. I find it quite extraordinary uh, that economic growth uh, is pursued without differentiating between whether that growth is good or bad for the planet. It is ridiculous and yet it is still done and wherever I go and have the opportunity of speaking on subject people just agree. Yes, of course it's ridiculous. And yet it's done in our bloody names. I mean, it's extraordinary. Not differentiating between things, between uh, um, progress so-called, which is good for the planet and bad for the planet. And what's bad for the planet is the, is the growth uh, rather than the sharp decline of international tourism, of flying, of, of car manufacturing of all the energy intensive activities uh, which government wishes to ignore uh, um, uh, because it runs counter the concept of a burgeoning um, uh, gross, gross uh, GDP, G GDP. So uh, in conclusion, thank you Chair, uh, in conclusion um, I I'll just say that let's get real. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Juliet Michelson from the New Economics Foundation. Um, very pleased to be here today. Um, I'm going to take this theme of green growth, green growth versus degrowth. Um, and present an alternative to, to, to that dilemma um, in the form of the Happy, Happy Planet Index, which is one of our projects um, at NEF. Um, for those of you who haven't come across us, we're an independent UK think tank, and we work on economics, which works towards three broad principles, environmental sustainability, social justice, and people's well-being. Um, and our wellbeing programme was set up in 2001 to ask the overarching question, what would policy look like if it focused on improving wellbeing as the ultimate goal? So I think our starting point for everyone here is that we can't do business as usual. Um, and I think um, we just had a very eloquent explanation of, of that from Maya. Um, and a nice visual representation of that comes from um, Tim Jackson's Prosperity Without Growth, Growth Report, um, where the height of these bars represent the carbon intensity um, of every uh, dollar in the world economy. So the, the very high bar on the left-hand side it was the 2007 uh, world carbon mm. intensity, and the very short stubby uh, bars over towards the right are where we need to reach uh, to reach a 450 parts per million carbon target by 2050 under various different scenarios of population and uh, income growth. And you can see that whichever, whichever uh, scenario you pick, the reduction in carbon intensity is absolutely massive. Um, it's at a scale which we currently don't know how to achieve. And, but so, but the, this is the level that we need to achieve to allow incomes 
um, to keep growing um, between now and then. So that sort of growth just doesn't seem possible if we have any chance of, of uh, me meeting um, carbon reduction targets or, or, or going beyond them, as, as Maya has suggested we might want to do. So, um, what the, so what, how do we respond in, in the Green Movement um, to, to this dilemma? Well, um, as has been set up for us in this session, we um, often get offered this choice between green growth and degrowth. Green growth um, sounds like a good option. It, it sounds like we get to keep doing the growth that, that uh, we, we're told so often is so vital to the functioning of our economies, but do it in a green way. So, of course, the fear is um, that this is just too good to be true. It's a false dream. Um, we can't simply keep doing the same growth with the, that degree of improved carbon efficiency that we've, that we've seen is, um, is, is required, that no growth um, can really be green. And, of course, there's a fear from the opposite direction as well, which that green growth, in fact, just leads to economic disaster. Um, that will go back to the uh, food lives we saw in the Great Depression or worse, um, that it, it would be a matter of, of reversing years and decades of, of human progress. This is the thought that um, nothing green can really be growth. Um, so and then on the other side of the dilemma, dilemma there's this idea of, of, of degrowth um, uh, bound up in these ideas of, of contracting our economies. Um, and that we, we, need, we absolutely need to do this to meet environmental goals. Um, <clears throat> the trouble is that um, people are yet to be convinced that this can help us meet the economic goals, which, which, uh, which is the reason for wanting growth in the first place. And so we're back to some form of, of human social uh, disaster as a result. <clears throat> Meanwhile, outside the green bubble... What's happening? Well, the only option that we're being offered is um, business as usual. So these two uh, wonderful examples from Chancellor George Osborne um, in uh, speeches at the end of last year, um, who said, we're not going to save the planet by putting our country out of business, and talks about, um, in the budget statement, the burden of endless social and environmental goals. And this is the reality of um, our politics at the moment. But, so let, let's just stop and think, why, I mean, why is George saying this? Um, he, his incentives as, a, as an elected politician in a democracy are all towards prioritising um, the gro uh, uh, growth because there's not yet enough pressure on him to, to make the sort of case that um, there are other goals. Um, and much as I can see the advantages of, of living under the sort of benign green dictator that, that Myers described, I can't see one on the horizon anytime soon. So the reality is we are living in a democracy. Um, and, and at the moment, our leading politicians think about it like this. This is what he thinks that his, his role um, in government is. Um, start with natural resources. Um, mix in some human capital, some labour. Those are your inputs. And this is all aiming to produce growth as the ultimate output. And, 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 that's what, and that's what he said you can, in those two quotes there. As long as the government is achieving that, they can't be uh, called to account on any goals that might interfere with that. Um, but I'm sure I, I, mean, I'm sure I don't need to point out to, to the people in this room that there, there is something fundamentally wrong with this picture. So here's a different way of thinking about progress. Um, it's right that we start with natural resources. Ultimately, that is what all life on Earth depends on and um, as, as Mo said we are fundamentally limited by the resources mm -hmm. of, of our one planet but what should we be thinking about in that we are aiming to do with those resources um, well at the New Economics Foundation the way we think about it is that the, the ultimate output, the ultimate outcome of human endeavour should be creating well-being by which we mean good lives for people and we've done a lot of work on the idea that um, the best way of understanding whether people have good lives is not by using economic proxies like GDP, but by asking people directly um, to sum up how they feel their lives are going. Um, we now know there's a whole body of uh, literature and science which shows that these measures can be robust and reliable, 
And they're a very good direct way of understanding um, how human lives are within a society. Um, there is still a role for the economy in this picture because it's, it's human activity um, and, and societies which translate resources into the outcome of well-being. But we must put it in its place. It's a mediator um, and it, it goes along with all sorts of other human systems, with democracy, with education, with health systems and so on, in terms of producing uh, well-being from resources. So this way of thinking leads to our framework um, that we have created in terms of uh, conceptualising and measuring societal progress. So um, it's, it's these same three spheres um, that we think are really key to think about. Um, Fundamentally, resources, and the, the key thing to measure there is our use of limited ecological resources. Our goals in terms of well-being for all, um, because of course it's not, it's not just important to have an average level of high well-being, but the way that well-being is distributed within a society and also globally is, is fundamentally important. Um, people value fairness. That came out in the UK government's recent consultation on what people thought national well-being was, and fairness was a goal that cut across everything else. So well-being for all is a fundamental goal. And the performance of human systems, um, the economy and the other sorts of systems um, of the type I've given some examples, um, are also definitely worthy of attention um, and need to be measured. Um, and then between these two headline spheres, you get this fundamental efficiency relationship um, and the goal of creating sustainable well-being, good human lives that don't cost the earth. Now, um, in the context of what we're talking about today, the economy, it's, it's interesting to note that, that what we have here is economic performance, um, not growth. The economy is important, but what's important about it is whether or not economic activity um, succeeds in meeting our ultimate goals. Um, and, and that's why we need, we need this to, to introduce this concept of economic performance as the actually key thing, the most important thing about the economy, in terms of its contribution to sustainable well-being. And, and, and it's also worthy of note that um, it's not just the economy which improves well-being. We, we, we know that income does have an effect on well-being. But so do all sorts of other things, um, crucially social relationships, meaningful activity, doing things for and with other people. All of these things are potentially achievable in very low carbon ways. And so we start to see a sketch of um, a, a vision of a positive future for society that can start achieving our full range of goals, both uh, for the planet and for people. Now, this doesn't get us out of answering the question, can we have growth and achieve our goals? Um, at NEF, I have colleagues who are working uh, away very hard on this question. Um, this is a screenshot of just one part of a very complicated model that my um, economist colleagues are building, a macroeconomic model that they are using to um, help them answer the question, what does an economy look like which achieves both our environmental and social goals? Don't ask me to explain the details, but I'd be very happy to put anyone in touch with, with, with my colleagues if you have detailed questions about this. But the, the re real reason I put this up today is the point that we may or may not um, be able to have some form of growth in order to meet, meet our goals. But the, the key point is that that shouldn't be the, the thing that we, we focus on. Instead, our work on the Happy Planet Index is an attempt to... Uh, get a focus on the thing that's, that's really important, a measure of sustainable well-being. So um, this week, on Thursday, we released um, the latest set of results for, for, for this index. Um, and, and what does it actually tell us? Well, it um, broadly <coughs> uses three components to rank the performance of countries around the world. It uses a measure of experienced well-being, ask, asking people to rate how they feel their lives are going overall. Um, the well-established measure of life expectancy and the ecological footprint measure, which is a measure produced by the Global Footprint Network. It's a consumption-based measure um, that, in, um, in the units of global hectares, gives a notional amount of land that would be needed to produce everything consumed by 
um, people per capita living in a country. And that includes the waste they, they produce, so carbon emissions um, are, are a very big part of ecological footprint. Um, and so broadly, what the Happy Planet Index does is tells you, within a given country, how many happy life years, what's your happy life expectancy, how many happy years of life could you expect to live, um, does a country produce per unit of resource input. And this starts to offer a way out of the growth versus sustainability dilemma. Um, this chart uh, ranks countries, or, or plots countries rather, by their GDP per capita against their ecological footprint. And you can see that there's a fairly strong linear relationship here. As one goes up, the other goes up too. So increasing GDP is fairly fundamentally linked to um, uh, increasing impact on the planet. Um, and, and therein is this, this terrible dilemma that we're faced with. But if we instead plot happy life years against the ecological footprint, you start to see a different sort of relationship. It's, it's a much more curved relationship. So um, the country, the black triangles at the bottom, which represent sub-Saharan African countries, are doing pretty um, badly in terms of happy life years, and they've got low ecological footprints. But as you start increasing ecological footprints, you increase happy life years. But then you start to notice something. There's a huge spread of, e of high and higher ecological footprints for about the same level of well-being. Mm. Um, so increasing ecological footprints more and more simply take you more into the, the, the red zone of, of um, more and more impact on the planet without really buying you much more in terms of improving well-being. So what the Happy Planet Index is doing is really a way of redefining uh, what we mean by economic efficiency. Um, this, this is a, a way we've come up with a communication, this idea which is currently doing the rounds on Facebook. Um, what is the, which economy is more efficient, the USA or Costa Rica? Um, Costa Rica comes top of our Happy Planet Index this year, and you can see that it, it's beating the USA on life expectancy, and also in terms of how people are ex experiencing their lives. And it's doing it at an environmental cost far below that of the USA. Um, we should, um, I should say that the Costa Rica isn't, isn't, isn't perfect. That ecological footprint is still above the level that would mean it was using its global fair share of resources. But it's much, much closer to it than, than, um, than in America. Um, more broadly, the results show that the countries that are performing best on the index um, are particularly those um, in kind of what you might call middle development countries, particularly Latin American. And uh, another way of looking at the results where we colour code countries by how, how many of those three components of the Happy Planet Index they do well on. Um, you can see that the worst results here do fall in sub-Saharan Africa and also those countries with really high footprints. So what will it take to achieve the goal of sustainable well-being? We absolutely shouldn't downplay the scale of the challenge that this involves. Um, looking over time, this is uh, data for the components of the Happy Planet Index, which we've been able to forecast back for the OECD countries, the, the club of, of rich countries um, in the world, mm -hmm. back to 1960, um, from 1964 to 2005. And you can see that over that period, there's been a massive increase um, in footprint with some variation over that time a small, steady increase in happy life years, but which has been unrelated to those fluctuations in footprint. Um, and so overall, this has seen a drop-off in the level of the Happy Planet Index overall. So what does this mean going forward? Well, and we can, of course, argue about what the right targets to be aiming for are. But even to aim for the, the, the fairly conservative, you might argue, target of an 80% reduction in carbon emissions <coughs> by 2050, we can see the scale of the challenges we, we're going to need um, in, in these trends. It's going to take a massive amount of economic, social and technological innovation to bring down that footprint level. But the Happy Planet Index and examples of countries like Costa Rica suggest that there is a way of doing this in a while maintaining and, and even perhaps promoting a good human lives. I will stop there. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the Happy Planet Index, I've got um, report copies with me today and also um, posters of the results. 
you can also check out our website where you can um, explore the data in detail for each country. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. A lot to absorb there, and now I'm going to uh, open up to questions. I've got one myself, though, just, just for clarity, to, to kick things off. Slightly big question. I wasn't quite sure where either of you stood on this. Do you think we should be scrapping GDP or tweaking it? I mean, I'll, I'll go first. Can everyone hear me? Um, uh, so I think it's about building up a head of steam um, to change the incentives on politicians like George Osborne um, behind the idea that the goal should be sustainable well-being. Um, I, I think talking about replacing, scrapping GDP um, is just playing directly into people's fears of sort of economic disaster, which I represented with, with my photo of the bread line. Um, Build it, trying to focus on, on the goals that are really important and building um, political will and public support is, is, is what's really important. Um, GDP might have a role to play in that. It might be useful to know, for example, the sorts of figures around carbon intensity um, per, per, uh, you know, per dollar GDP. Um, then again, as I said, it might be useful to develop a measure of economic performance, which, which focuses better on how the economy is delivering its goals. But in a way, I think that's a secondary question from, from getting a focus on the things that really do matter. Well, it's, it's, it's an easy question to answer, really, because uh, in, in my view, uh, any addition uh, to, uh, to the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, must be looked at askance because it is making matters worse. Uh, now, that's not to say that we can look to an immediate future in which, therefore, we, we uh, uh, have to al allow it to go on. And it is for that reason that the whole concept, the framework of contraction and convergence of personal carbon allowances gets over that problem, because what will dictate the amount of carbon emissions will be uh, whether individuals, by choice, are living or not within their... Uh, uh, annual allowance, and that will determine what are the demands for energy intensive activity. Well, by definition, they will fall sharply uh, because people won't have. I mean, I, the way I've described it in my Penguin book, uh, how we can save the planet is that it's a, a, a parallel currency, uh, your carbon allowance, because it will be, it, it can be um, um, bought and sold on the open market if you can live a lifestyle within within your annual allowance, then you're going to uh, get progressively wealthy. And uh, I'm talking about this in the context not just of this country, because what worries me is so much of the discussion is, um, is UK-oriented. Uh, we've got to have a global solution. So uh, people living in the third world who, as you've shown so uh, easily, um, uh, so legibly, um, uh, People in the third world, like like uh, sub-Saharan Africa, who will have m most of their annual allowance to sell, they will be the recipients of that uh, tradable process, and that will transfer to them from the wealthier world in a socially a socially just way uh, a, 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 an amount of money. Uh, but at the same time, the the essential need to not to exceed the ceiling determined by climate scientists. Uh, related to the total global amount of CO2 emissions will be held. So I see this as not a problem stemming from any interpretation of economic growth one way or the other, but simply as a function of an essential process, which is living within the planet's means. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've seen four hands go up. So first of all, man in the green, man in the hat, sorry for the vague descriptions, um, and then there's someone down here, and then you're number four, we'll take those four first, and then we'll come across to this side. So, so um, my question or comment is, is uh, really aimed at Julia. I wonder um, uh, whether the problem is money itself, right, and our, and our understanding of it. I, um, I know it seems like a bit of a, a radical concept, but... Um, like a, a few books, like Charles Eisenstein, for example, talks about this concept of a gift economy and how our, our, our use of money like allows us to kind of be completely disattached from the social and environmental consequences. And, and obviously it's a huge kind of revolution in, in how we're going to interact with one another, but trying to solve 
the the problems like the you know convergence of crises with, with the thinking that we're currently using. Can you come to the question, please? Uh, might, not, <laughs> might not work. What what about what about completely um, you know radical forms of uh, economy? Radical forms of economy. What do you think? Sorry. Are we, uh, do you, do you um, well, you're right. We'll take we'll take the other three. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Alex Holland. Um, I didn't think that Meyer's portrayal of the future, if we don't take radical steps, was pessimistic. It was very realistic. But in terms of only and overwhelmingly focusing on a narrative of the doom that is, you know, coming upon us and the massive sacrifices that are going to have to be made building support for those sacrifices. And it's not been working that way so far, I think, and, and it's not going to work, I think. And I think the really key thing is, for everybody in the sustainability movement, to put more energy and more effort into be, having the confidence of thinking of what a sustainable and socially just world, post-consumption world, would really look like and would really involve, and think about the policies and the economy bases are colleagues at NEPA, and how to promote that more broadly, and I do do my carbon footprint calculation. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Uh, there was a third question. I think it was... I think you were four. There was a third person. Was it you? I can't remember who I pointed to. I'll go... Yes. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think one of the problems is... is, is that comment or also, question? Sorry, yes. Well, the, the question is, why are we always talking in terms of the current market system, because that seems to be the implication behind it. Yeah. I mean, essentially, I mean, growth, when they talk about growth, what they really mean is profits, because at yeah. the end of the day, they don't just produce any old stuff, they produce stuff that makes profits, and they produce stuff to make profits. And if you're still accepting that there's going to be profits at the end of the day, then really I don't see that, you know, the whole logic of the system, that's why we're in this mess in the first place. Yeah. And I think, you know, really that the, the fight for, if we can, then the fight to stop climate change is going to have to mean also a fight for, for a different kind of society entirely, a different kind of way. It, it's not because the capitalist way will not work. I mean, that's the whole point. That's why we're in the com yeah. competitive accumulation is the problem that we actually have. And that's, that's what they mean by, you know, that's really what growth means. It's not about providing stuff for people. It's about providing, it's the competitive... Uh, push for profit. Absolutely. So, yeah. can I, if I could re reframe what you said into a question, um, <laughs> are you saying that uh, is the drive for growth fundamentally flawed? Is it, or drive for profits fundamentally flawed? Yes. And fourth person. Wait, can I possibly come into the stack? Because I have to leave and I'm really anxious to get an answer from yeah. my question. All right, uh, yes, thank you very much. The matter front has said that's fine, so go ahead. <laughs> quantifying the carbon produced by economic activity which is against well-being, for instance, wars and the arms trade and maintenance of armies. That's just one example, but it's a big one. Or that's done for the well-being of a very few people, or that's done only for the sake of profit, or only for the sake of capital accumulation. This is similar to that man's uh, point. Because it seems to me that starting off by telling people who don't have very much to begin with, that they have to have less, is pretty much of a non-starter for building a movement. Whereas looking at the things that are damaging us and working against us, and also uh, building up carbon, uh, you're kind of onto a winner. So having that quantification could be very useful for us if it's being done. Okay, so quantifying costs there. And then one more for the surrounding quite a lot already. Um, heard from Mayer the scale of the problem, but the solution was talked about in terms of a market solution. Um, Ellen Ostrom has talked about things like sort of shared community techniques for managing resources and whether that's something we should look at. And the well-being thing, it's all very well, but in Rio they're talking mainly about sustainable development goals. Lots of countries around the world still want to develop to get be better. They, we are still building roads here. Urbanisation is building a city for a million people every five days around the world. Um, half of Shanghai's carbon footprint last year was the construction industry. All very, well, all very great talking about alternatives to consumption, but what about the process of development? How do you see economics and development linking together, and can we link them together 
in a steady state economy, or do we have to actually say we're not going to have any more developments, we're going to have transition instead? Thank you very much. There's quite a lot. Five questions there for uh, <laughs> the two of you, so I'll leave it up to you as to which one you tackle first. <laughs> Should I, I, would get, I mean, I'll try to um, uh, uh, put them all together in because it seems to me that they uh, can be dealt with in that way, uh, which is, I mean, maybe I'm being too simplistic, I hope not, but it seems to me that the adoption of a system of carbon rationing uh, um, makes unnecessary uh, the issue of how we attain growth and what form it takes the form it will take will be the form that it will take following the adoption of carbon rationing. And if that results, results, as I believe it will do, in more demand for local activity within your community um, or, or um, more, um, what was the word you use, or more um, shared communities, well, in fact, that's just the logical thing. A community will get together and see they can't each put up a little wind turbine, but... Um, as a shared thing, they can lower their lower the demand made on their carbon allowance by sharing uh, the construction of a of, of a wind turbine and benefiting from that and being able to sell the surplus that would otherwise be entailed you know, on them not going for that e efficient way of delivery. Mm. And I think the same thing will hold true about. Uh, other areas of economic growth, and we're, in my book, I'm only thinking about areas of economic growth which depend upon the burning of fossil fuels. Other areas, and whether they're profit-making or non-profit-making, I don't think we need worry about it. The essential consideration, and I think there's a danger of taking one's eye off the ball, not just to look at that. The essential consideration is ensuring that the planet is remains in a re re reasonably habit habitable state in the future. If one starts talking about other matters, so to speak, uh, one's taking, as I say, one's taking one's eye off the ball. That is what we've got to do. And what comes in the wake of that is, and many of you here, I would hope, uh, for instance, uh, 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 believe uh, that um, uh, uh, people should be encouraged to cycle. The effect of the introduction of carbon rationing is well, people will choose to cycle. They won't have to be encouraged to do so. They will choose to because their ration won't stretch to them commuting by car or by public transport over, over long, longer distances. Uh, so it just and, and then there's the social justice side, which is the transfer. I would hope that most people here believe in social justice and not social injustice, as we've, uh, 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 which has got us to the parlous state we're in now. Uh, the, the the outcome of this whole process is social justice, better health, better diet. Uh, the, the the you know consideration about. Well, how are we going to pay for our roads? There won't be a demand for road use. There won't be a demand for rail use. There won't be any demand for air travel simply because the ration won't stretch to it. So you don't have to worry about any other considerations. Now, you how know, would it be administered, though? I mean, would you issue tokens, dockets? Yeah, how would absolutely. You, you, would, you would get on January the first. You would get your annual carbon allowance, which would buy a card, which would be reduced as and when I you see. engaged in any carbon-based activity. And mm. I draw, as I said in my opening remarks, considerable comfort from my experience in 1939, uh, when you know we were each given a paper ration book, yeah. and when you went into the uh, grocery shop and you asked for half a pound of butter, you paid for the half a pound of butter, and your coupons were taken out of the book. Well, we've got more sophisticated ways of dealing with that, uh, with you know swiping cards and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. And in truth. Uh, um, David Miliband, when he was Secretary of State of the Department of the Environment three or four years ago, uh, um, um, commissioned a study into the feasibility of carbon rationing, which then reported that it was a brilliant idea, but there were two downsides to it. Number one, it would cost too much, which is a complete nonsense because we were able to have a system of uh, as I say, food rationing. Uh, uh, and, and secondly, uh, um, that was, oh yes, that it was too far advanced of, of, of what the public would be prepared to support, uh, which again is just a, a, a further indication of the failure of government uh, to understand that its primary responsibility is to spell out the hazardous uh, route 
that we are taking and, uh, in, and uh, uh, the, the reason why uh, all political parties, perhaps with the exception of the Greens, are not prepared to say how serious the situation is for the <coughs> Martin Luther King reason that you don't want, you won't attract votes if you say the future is bleak. Okay, I, I think I, I failed to provide my, the urgent answer in time for the question, but I'll, I'll start with that one. We, we haven't attempted that piece of work with sort of separating out um, economic activity in, into that which is beneficial towards and, and, and harmful to well-being and sort of um, assessing the carbon consequences of each. It's, a, it's an interesting thought um, uh, and perhaps something that, that might be worth looking at in the future. Um, We've had we had various questions all on the theme of, of you know is X is X the problem? So um, uh, first we had it is mark are markets uh, the problem in themselves? Um, I'm I'm not sure that I've personally been convinced of that. Um, I'm not an economist, um, but I mean my understanding is you know that the sort of very early explanations of the benefits of markets by the kind of founding fathers of, of uh, economics, uh, people like David Ricardo, um, you know, met, met, met set out the case in terms of markets are an efficient way of, of exchange. Um, you can make profits by um, specialising within different skill areas. And I'm not sure that exchange and, and developing skills are things that we are going to want to eliminate um, from society in the future. Um, what we, of course, do need to recognise is, is the limits and the flaws of markets and um, not make the market king over society. Um, so that where we do have market mechanisms in operation, we um, do that, uh, we, we, we put checks and balances and, and limits on those markets because the, the, the aim of markets should be to create human well-being. Mm. Um, is money the problem? Well, actually, I think, yes, money and, and the way that money is created might be part of the problem, and, and that's something that um, colleagues at the New Economic Foundation are doing a lot of work at. Some of you might have come across um, the book that we were involved in producing, Where Does Money Come From?, um, which talks about the way that, in, in effect, um, the money creation system um, is utterly in the hands of um, the private banking system um, and is, is um, therefore, some of the implications of that are that it's, it's not being used um, to, to um, further the best interests of society, but the best interests of, of those few um, in, whom, in whose hands um, that system rests. Um, so I, I think that is, is definitely an area that, that uh, it is, it is in need of um, attention and reform. Um, and then is, is development the problem? Well, I do think, again, there are lots of assumptions bound up in this idea of development and sustainable development about um, the, the sorts of forms that we would expect that to take. Um, and I think the more that we can get people to focus on sustainable well-being as the goal, um, the more we can get away from perhaps some of those harmful um, assumptions about what development must be. Um, thank you, Alex, for um, mentioning the idea of um, building a movement. Um, I think that is, is crucially important and something I forgot to say when I was talking about our work on the Happy Planet Index is that we <coughs> have, um, alongside the new results, this week launched a Happy Planet Charter, which calls on governments and on the UN and on society at large to start... Um, doing the work and developing the political will to create these measures of what really matters. Um, and if you're a member of an organisation which you think would be interested in signing up at the Charter, do let me know. You can have a look at the full text in the report or on the website. Okay, okay. let's take another three from this side. There are a lot of hands over here before. So first, you're there, and then you're the beige jacket, and then we'll take a third at the back. So take three, three at once. Okay, um. Um, I was just wondering about the, the list of things in the Happy Planet Index. Um, it seems, excluding Costa Rica is on the top, that seems to me to be a list of countries in the top 18 that have um, very bad social justice records uh, with uh, human rights, uh, gender equality, etc. And I'm just wondering... Um, you know, maybe it's uh, coming on to Maya's point, is when you have uh, societies that are being controlled centrally or um, social, uh, social justice is actually put aside, is that, is that an area that's going to be our future in uh, Western Europe or in, uh, in, in the global north? Uh, 
um, in the future. I mean, I, I can't see many of the countries in that top 18 uh, that I would like to live in. So, just to summarize so my question, question is, is, that, is this the future? Do we, is this do we the have future? to put our, our, our human rights, our social justice aside to, to get onto this happy planet? And just for the speakers, I put that up on the screen. Thank you. So, yes. Uh, I think it's worth understanding why growth is regarded as being so important. Um, my feeling is that it's related to inequality, that it's, it allows us, the, the promise of growth allows us to avoid confronting the causes of inequality. Uh, does, uh, my, the question, but my question is, do you see another reason why growth is regarded as being so important? Okay, so growth and equality, thank you. I like your idea of sort of enlightened Plato's Republic in order to deal with climate change. Um, but how could this be tangible without some sort of coup d'etat? Without? Without some sort of coup d'etat, without some sort of you know, violent taking over of the state. How, how is this a tangible idea? So, uh, progress without violence, in a sense. <laughs> Revolution without violence. <laughs> so, okay. that's a small one. So, three there. So, is this chart the future? Why is growth important? Or how do we factor in considerations of inequality into growth? And mm -hmm. thirdly, how do we achieve the revolution needed without violence? Um, yeah, so um, on the uh, um, human rights mm -hmm. and uh, social justice point, I mean, I, I, I think I take issue that, that, that that's a table where, where all the countries that do well um, have um, very bad human rights problems. But of course, there are those problems in every country. And I absolutely acknowledge that some of those countries up there might be out at you as... Um, having rather oppressive to totalitarian governments, um, um, and and also problems of, of inequality. Um, so the Happy Planet Index doesn't measure everything there is to know about a society, and of course it's important, it's, going to, it's crucially important to measure whether those kind of fundamental minima that we want for our societies are, are happening, and, and a focus on human rights remains um, crucially important. Um, uh, but the reason, and, 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 and sort of the implicit question, how, how come countries can do well and, and still have those sorts of issues? Um, well, the reality seems to be that actually in, in some countries where, where we associate thinking of kind of really major human rights abuses, um, that in fact they're, they're still affecting sort of the minority of the population. So that on average they're still doing, getting decent scores um, in, in terms of the well, their well-being. And when you then add in the efficiency in terms of environmental sustainability, that raises performance up the table. But it should remain every country's goal um, to um, ensure that all of their citizens have their human rights met, while also promoting sustainable well-being. We did, as an exercise this year, um, uh, a sort of experimental way of looking at what would happen if we adjusted the Happy Climate Index for inequality in the two outcome measures in um, experienced well-being and life expectancy. And that um, does affect the scores of, of some countries, but in fact um, Costa Rica and Vietnam remain the top two when we do that. Um, and, and there's more about that in the report. Um, I do have another answer to why um, growth is important. It's not my answer, actually. It's, it's the, the answer that Tim Jackson gives in his um, Prosperity Without Growth report, which is um, I've absolutely recommended reading on, on this topic, topic area um, and very readable. And basically, his explanation is that um, growth is what counteracts the technology factor in terms of um, making things uh, more efficient in, in, in the old sense of thinking about what efficiency is. So as technology um, removes the need for so much um, labour input into the process, we need jobs to make sure there um, remain enough... Um, we need growth to ensure there remain enough jobs in the economy. And, and that actually does... If you think about things in those terms, it starts pointing towards what part of our, the solution to this dilemma might be in that we need to start investing in areas which are sustainable and which promote jobs, but not necessarily, um, which do that in that old efficient way of reducing as far as possible um, the labour impact. So there's some interesting food for thought there. And I mean, I think I, I think I agree with the direction of the question about Plato's Republic. I, I, I do remain committed to um, uh, living in a democracy. Um, and I, I think we need, as a movement, to build support for the idea that we can achieve green lives 
along with well-being and, and not see it as something which people feel they have to vote against to protect their own interests. Uh, just a, a couple of uh, quick points. I, I apologise if I didn't make myself clear, but I can't understand why objections should be raised to the concept of carbon rationing, if I understood the question correctly, is how do we escape violence associated with uh, the, the changes that are required. I don't think that uh, violence comes into it. And again, I go back to September 1939, there was no violence when food rationing was introduced, but maybe I misunderstood the question. And the second point was uh, on the question of um, equality. Again, maybe I wasn't clear enough in what I was saying, but insofar as uh, the use of fossil fuels is such a major component in our lifestyles, affecting almost every aspect of our lives concerned with material well-being, um, uh, it seems to me that the third world should be, will be, uh, laughing all the way to their bank, so to speak, as this process is introduced, and they are the recipients of the transfer of very and increasingly substantial sums of money from the affluent parts of, of, of the world uh, to the poor parts. And for, from that perspective alone, even if it had nothing to do with climate change, I would have thought it should be strongly welcomed because it seems to me a far fairer way of redistributing wealth than for the UK, for instance, to say that it will raise its contribution to world aid from you know 0.67 percent of of, um, of uh, GDP to 0.68 percent. Uh, with this system, it's a it's it's a transfer payment which will enable them to live much far more uh, secure and acceptable lives as we have been able to, whereas we in the West will have to pay for that, uh, you know, in, in a very fair way. I can't see people coming along and saying, I don't like this requirement to pay, uh, to pay or to buy the surplus of people living in third world countries. Um, uh, that, that that is the logical that is the logical way of dealing with finite capacity of the planet's atmosphere to absorb further burning of fossil fuels without it being so damaging that the whole economic and capitalist system collapses because I think that would be extremely damaging and I can assure you I've never supported capitalism in my life or anything like that but I do see it having an important function and get back to the sort of principal theme of this uh, uh, mm -hmm. session. Uh, it is, uh, and you heard me say, how can you attach a monetary value uh, to uh, a process of uh, the release of a ton of carbon emissions insofar as so much of its consequences will be damaging but don't, can't be valued in monetary terms. Uh, in this instance, by uh, making it a tradable com component, uh, the market will determine what is the value as a function of the availability of surplus uh, uh, of, carbon, of carbon units and the demand for that surplus. But what is essential is that it won't exceed the ceiling the total in number of emissions because that will determine what the annual allowance is for everybody. So it seems to me a sort of foolproof system and perhaps that's its primary failure. It's so simple and so straightforward that people think instinctively, there must be something wrong with it. You know, it's too good to be true. I think we'll look, look at a gift horse in the mouth. Thank you very much. Okay. We've got to try and get that broad spread three across here. So we go... You first, and then at the end there, and then we'll go to you. So we'll take three again. So. Yes, I just wanted to pick up on... Uh, Please be clear whether it's a comment or question or anything. No, it's, it's going to start as a comment, and I think it will turn into a question. All right. Um, <laughs> I just want to pick up okay. on what Juliet said just now about you know, the explanation for growth being, well, technology makes production more efficient and thereby, thereby eliminates jobs, and so therefore we've got to create more jobs in order to uh, deal with those poor people that get made redundant by technology. And, um, uh, I mean, you sounded you'd like, although maybe, you, uh, I don't know, I wasn't quite sure whether you later added a phrase that didn't sound like you accepted that fundamental process. But um, 
so I guess one of my questions is, do you accept do you accept that that is the way the world has to work? No. Um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned before, you know, I'm from this group that's celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Luddite uprisings. This was precisely what they were fighting. The, yeah. Basically, the capital, the capitalist imperative of capital intensification of production. Um, uh, production always has to rely more on capital, less on labour, uh, you know, because basically work as a trouble and uh, who wants to pay them, you know? Um, and uh, so that's mean. why I think, uh, to, uh, to me at least, it, it, it's, not, it's obvious that we need to get to a world, uh, you know, uh, beyond that, where, where technology, the capitalist technology is not the, our master, but, you know, technology is, is, is controlled by us. Um, and to me, at least, the only way the only way you can do that is 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 to improve to a world which is fundamentally non-capitalist. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, and I, I will say that I think you're balking that that challenge. Um, I think your you know your 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 suggestions are somehow that we can carry on with uh, with a fundamentally capitalist mode and we'll we'll tweak it a bit by adding in measures of happiness, but. The fundamental process is, is what causes uh, causes all the problems. Yeah. Okay. So does growth mean job losses, in a sense? Yeah, just to, to move on from the Plato's Republic question, uh, I think uh, the question is, how do we get uh, from the state we are in now to uh, your global uh, carbon rationing system? In particular, I would imagine that you would get quite a fight from a large percentage of people living at least in the OECD countries. How uh, how can you get over that? Uh, uh, the transition, right? Thank you. Uh, I think I, I want to actually uh, also continue with this question, but maybe challenge you a little bit more because in the beginning you were also saying that you want to challenge us with your carbon footprint question, and I hope that. Um, it's also part of the intergenerational justice that you not be not too harsh on me afterwards. <laughs> but, um, I wonder whether you're not actually kind of fundamentally mixing um, the, the relation between like first you have carbon rationing and then you have activities. Is it not actually exactly the, the other way around that you need first to have the activities of the people in order for the state to, to do something sensible because the way you perceive the state is as, and that maybe also comes into your way of, okay, maybe we have to end democracy when it comes to carbon rationing. Is it is actually the other way around? The state is not going to, to engage with, with measures like that because it will be kind of maybe captured by capital interests who want to um, produce profits now and want to maximize profits now on the expense of the future. So in order to tame the state, actually, you need now the movements and now the civil society, um, which then could result in the state to do something like that. And this is actually fundamental democracy, and this is the, the answer the question, to, to that. No, it's not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Sorry. you for clarifying. <laughs> yeah, just, I, I just want to make that clear, because I think that, that it's, a, it's a problem when the, when the environmental movement goes in this kind of authoritative um, direction. I think that, that, that cannot be the case. We need a substantive democracy in order to, to um, fight this climate change. Um, okay. All right. Thank you very much. I think just I notice a lot of people are leaving. It's quarter to six. A few people have hands in here. I'm sorry. We're going to leave the questions at that. So the two final questions are, does growth necessarily mean job losses or unemployment? And how do we make this transition to carbon rationing? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I actually, I, I, completely, I completely agree. Uh, with, with what I think you were saying, I, 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 just, I think it's a good description of how the world works. But I, I don't. I think we do need to move to a world where technology is, is not the master, um, as you say. And I, and I don't think that's a matter of, of just tweaking. Um, at NEF, we we have a sort of overarching program of work which which puts a lot of what we do together. And it's called the Great Transition, um, and and what we're talking about there is is really a, a fundamental change to the way that um, our economy works. Um, and, and to, uh, to really bring it into the service of of society, um, is it? Will it be capitalism? I, I I am. I don't. I don't know whether it would be recognisable as capitalism. But I, but I do know that it, it will require fundamental limits on on markets. There's a far different system to the one we've got now. Um, 
and, and I think the great transition is, is really part of part of our, our answer to the, to the how do we get there question. I mean, in a way, none of us can claim to know how we're going to get there. Um, the, the level of, of change and innovation that's going to be required um, it is massive. But one of the ways that we, we use our idea of sustainable well-being is, is, a, is a heuristic, it's a rule of thumb. If we ensure that every action we take is tending in a direction towards sustainable well-being, then um, as, as humanity as a whole, we, we might just get there. Uh, just a, a few words. Um, I, I'm intrigued. Firstly, the, on, on the issue of uh, growth. I mean, nobody, I don't think, would suggest that growth in education or growth in musical appreciation or growth in, in, in those areas which aren't carbon dependent.